Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I am excited to see so many familiar faces, excited to see a lot of new faces. Um, my name is Darnisa Monte, as you've heard. I'm originally from Brooklyn. As you know, I'm probably going to tell you five or six more times. So we're just going to settle in and get comfortable. Um, I want to start because there was a lot of resonance across a lot of the stories that I heard this morning. And one of the key things that we'll be doing together today, both here and after this session, is learning how to tell a story about why dismantling inequity matters to you. But I'm never going to ask you to do something that I'm not going to model for you or take you through a clear why is that so important for us. So one, growing up in Brooklyn, I'm resonating with you, Will. So I'm an 80s baby. I'm fully OK with dating myself. Um, born in the, I don't even know if that's early, mid, 84, 1984, just putting it out there, right? So being born in 1984 in East New York, um, OK? I'm from Cypress Hills, folks, OK? So I'm right near where y'all are at, OK? I had. I don't know if it was the pleasure or displeasure, right, of seeing what happens when drugs rips through your entire family. You know, having to be one of the few people in your classes from a two-parent or grandparent or auntie-uncle place. I am the first in my family to do everything as it relates to education. You see, the path to Brandeis and then later that path to Harvard didn't come because my grandparents or my parents knew how to create that path for me. It came because I could never imagine having anyone else have to experience the things that I saw in the 80s and the 90s and that honestly I saw this morning, right? The present is not as different from the 80s as we like to think it is. And so a big part of my why, a big part of the reason that I do what I do really is to pay homage to what I experienced in Brooklyn, to continue to build hope for the changes that we can see over time. And I will always, when able, deeply connect and share pieces of my own experiences with you to understand why that is so important for all of the service work that you will do in this year or next, and any service work that you decide to do for the rest of your life, because I don't know if you know, but social justice is lifetime work. Welcome to the party. Yeah. OK. Oh, there's one down here. Look at that. Y'all supposed to help me out. Let me know the screen down here. Um, and so I want to start <laughs> fully transparent, but it's helpful. Um, I want to start by talking about one of my favorite films of all time. How many people in here have seen The Matrix? 19? That's not enough hands on this side. I don't know what happened. OK, OK, y'all were just, hands were just low? All right. If you have not seen it, I will try to be as descriptive as possible. But if you have, just sit with me. See, The Matrix is a film that was created in 1997 by the Wachowski brothers. I do not work for the Wachowski brothers. I just like to give you all the details. Um, and it was a film which I don't know if you know, but The Matrix was written by a black woman who was not given credit for that film. I'm just speaking truth to fire, <laughs> OK? Um, and so in the film, there is a character whose name is Neo, who is convinced that the world doesn't feel right. He's gone on a quest for something that he knows is called The Matrix. No one knows what it is. No one knows what it does. But Neo is convinced he has to find the answer. So one day, he finds a gentleman named Morpheus, who is played by Lawrence Fishburne. Just giving you all the names. Um, <laughs> And Lawrence Fishburne has told Neo that he has an option. He can take two different pills. There's a red pill and a blue pill. The blue pill will inevitably put you back to sleep so that you're not able to understand what the matrix is and you will forget everything. But the red pill is a pill of enlightenment. It will show you the world for what it really is but once you know what the matrix is, you can't ever unsee it. This presentation is your red pill. There will be things that you see around inequity today that you may have never seen before. 
I want you all to understand that for some of us, you are going to wake up and realize that this world is very different than what you knew it to be. And for some of you today, you may feel affirmed for the very first time, because I'm just gonna tell you what the world really is, and it's gonna resonate because you've also been saying it. I am not the only expert in this room. I just happen to be privileged to have access to this stage. So I wanna lift up where you've been, affirm the experiences for communities who've been invalidated perpetually. I wanna wake the folks up who may not even know that you were asleep, but the goal here is to do it with love. You heard Dream say that this work is hope work, and I will tell you that sometimes in the deepest, darkest despair, the only thing you have is hope. Hope, though, must be met with urgency and action. And I will tell you this, community, there is something very dangerous about being urgent with no competency. Okay, you can have the best intentions in the world and have urgency for change. If you do not have the knowledge to implement and to take action and to do that change with integrity, please pause and hold. You will do harm, not could do harm. And so this is a conversation about building your capacity to be urgent and to take action with care and with love and with hope and with service. Here's the thing, I cannot neatly wrap up all the things you should do well in 45 minutes. This is a longitudinal conversation. I'm just opening the door. I do not consider myself to be Morpheus, but I think I am one of the Morpheuses. <laughs> There are more Morpheuses there that are children than adults. Just let that be known. All right, so if you ever wonder about what children know, ask them. They will tell you. I think the greatest challenge is that we as adults have stopped listening to children because we believe they're not expert enough um, to give us their opinions. No, they're expert enough. It just may not have all the adjectives on it, but it will be truth. And so for our framing for this conversation, I want us to stop looking out of windows. You see, windows are nice, because you get to look out of them, and you get to talk about what other people are doing or what they're not doing. Look at what that person is doing. Look at this person. What is this, what is that, et cetera, et cetera. Today is not about externalizing what you're going to do to support changing the world. Today, I want you to own the fact that alibis are a myth. That's what the window is. You see, alibis tell us that you have to be in one place at a time. That you are either at home or you're at work. And unless you work from home, right, you can't be in both places at the same time. When it comes to equity work and diversity work and inclusion work, you are a both and. For my folks who love the matrix, there is a, there's a ship that everyone rides, it's the Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody wants to be Neo, nobody wants to get on the Nebuchadnezzar. And our others, for those who haven't seen The Matrix, everybody wants to be the hero in this story and no one wants to acknowledge that you are also the villain. You cannot be a part of any problem solving until you also acknowledge you are also the problem. You are both, and it is okay to be both. What is not okay is not being personally introspective about the way you could be showing up on other core members, or on students, or on this mission, okay? So the window is taking a deep look at yourself and wondering about who you are and what is your purpose and why are you serving and realizing that this mission is not only about changing the world, it is also about changing you because you are a part of the world. And that's where we are. 
One of the biggest things that we do at Deep is that we tell stories. Right, and so you'll hear some of my story, you've already heard some of it, but we also tell stories of others. I wanna bring Frederick Douglass into the space. Welcome, Frederick. Um, I always like to call and praise the ancestors because they are here, they are here. Um, and it doesn't matter what culture or tradition you are from, everyone has ancestors that we channel and that who speak through us and with us. And I wanna bring this quote up here because the first thing I wanna say this is not going to be an easy conversation. It's going to be really hard. It's going to be really uncomfortable. But I want to do some reframing for us. You see, a lot of times we think about agitation or conflict as a bad thing. The only way to truly be equitable is to be willing to sit and grapple with discomfort. So let me call some words from Frederick. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation want crops, or who, excuse me, are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never has and it never will. Equity, to be equitable, means to deconstruct structures and practices and policies that reinforce power and privilege. To do this well, we are going to have to agitate ourselves, we're going to have to agitate systems, and we're gonna to have to ask some difficult questions. For so, y'all know I'm from Brooklyn, and a tree grows in Brooklyn, right? So, because a tree grows in Brooklyn, this next part of my talk is, I'm assuming, I looked it up, I Googled it, but I heard that when you plant things, right, you gotta have some type, I'm being fully transparent, I didn't even see grass till I was 18, so, um, I didn't. <laughs> and I never sat on it, I have yet to walk barefoot on it, I'm a little suspicious, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's like dogs and everything in the grass, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe in my next life, <laughs> I will frolic in grass, but not this one, right? So, I have heard that you take a till or a hoe, right, and you actually rake up the top level of that soil. And if we are saying that we wanna have a bountiful harvest, if we're saying we wanna do this work well, that we don't wanna do harm, you have to be willing to till the soil to actually plant the seeds that will become the change that we want to see. I'm gonna say it now, and I hope you hold this. No one is coming to save you. You are the leaders your ancestors prayed for. I'm gonna say it one more time, because they're like, she said ancestors, which ancestors? I don't care who they are, right? There are folks who prayed for this moment. They prayed for change. They prayed for people to come forward and be a part of the change. We are the change. And the sooner you own that and know that we are not saved, that we are a part of the construction of the future, the whole different matrix you will see. So welcome. Before we have a really difficult conversation, I wanna take us through some norms. So, first off, our norms, the deep norms, are your norms. These are all the norms we've used with the organization, and these are to help keep us in some relative safety. You will notice a norm that is not up here is safe space. First of all, there is no such thing as safe space. Not in this work. And that is because discomfort and sitting in uncomfortable things is a prerequisite to being empathetic. And it's not about intentionally making people uncomfortable for the sake of discomfort. It's the, I need you to be uncomfortable to sit with the whole uncomfortableness of my life. Because my story is not easy. And if I tell you safe space, and I start sharing really hurtful 
things that have happened in my life, if you are too accustomed to being comfortable, you then are too accustomed to ignoring my discomfort. So that's why, that's why there's no safe space norm. Also, someone always feels unsafe in safe space. And I think it's important to acknowledge this conversation is going to feel very different to different people. And it's okay that we are on a spectrum. It's okay if you have no idea what equity looks like in practice. It's okay if you feel like you've been battling racism from the womb. There's a space for everyone here, and because of that spectrum, that is why we don't have space, safe space up on this norm, okay? Our first one is to be present, which I've seen all of you do. First of all, thank you, Academy team. Everybody who just got this together, I really love, I'm loving everything about it. Being present is just sit with me. Sit with discomfort. Own it. Taste it and begin to love it because that's what it means to be socially just. Our second norm is we want to assume good intentions and take responsibility for impact. That's a two-part norm. You see, that first half of the norm, assume good intentions, doesn't really feel so good in this society anymore. We are now so polarized that if someone sneezes wrong, you can get like completely go viral for the wrong sneeze and now you done lost your job, you lost your kids, you lost your house, the dog done ran next door to the neighbors because you ain't feeding it the right food because you sneezed wrong, right? And so I'm just speaking truth here. You know it's true. I'm like afraid to do anything with a phone in my hand anymore. Um, and so the assuming good intentions is about grace. You are going to be in a lot of spaces with people who may not even know what you were talking about. You may feel right now like you don't know what I'm talking about, but the people who know, know. And so assuming good intentions, the grace work first off is, think about the world as a 100%. 95% of the entire world is actually fully uninformed. That means people have no context to understand difference. They have no context to understand how you've lived. They have no context to understand your story, and they may not even know why you feel a need to be socially just. This 95% is a colorblind 95%. These are folks who believe in a post-racial world. We had the civil rights movement. Aren't we done? No, we're not done. But that assuming good intentions is important because it allows you to wonder and to get curious with people. Instead of meeting people with, I can't believe you didn't know that, how could you be so non-woke, or how come we always have to talk about race? The first thing I want you to say is, I'm noticing that you've been asking a couple of questions, and I'm wondering if you know, dot, dot, dot. This norm is about giving people specificity. Structural racism has made it impossible for us to see each other, literally. Where would you learn about this? We don't learn about this in school. We certainly don't learn about this from the media. Many of our parents may not be able to have these conversations. So how would people actually know what the world really is unless you give them specificity to know? I don't ever want to talk amorphously, right? So let me give you some context here. Um, so my hair, right? You know, for those of you who like salon, she got a song, Don't Touch My Hair. This is a story about my hair. Um, so for those of you who've seen me before, you probably saw me today and you're like, oh, I love your summer style. You cut your hair off. I did not. My hair is, is uh, curled up in pipe cleaners, right? The children's toy pipe cleaners. My hair is this long. So next week it will be this long. And people have a habit of caressing my joint like we know each other um, often. <laughs> Often. So, oh, you said say it again? People have a habit of caressing my joint like we know each other. And I just want to give you an example of what this norm looks like. Because I do want to assume good intentions, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You can do really hurtful things to people when you are uninformed. This is about sharing knowledge and not blaming people. 
So our first one here is, I was in the bathroom washing my hands. Now, I have lived in Massachusetts collectively for 11 years. I'm not trying to say my Brooklyn edge is gone, but like my New York radar when somebody's real close to my personal space has lessened. So I'm, you know, I'm at the sink. You know, you gotta count your ABCs while you wash your hands. That's other information. They didn't ask for that in the keynote, but I hope that's helpful, right? So I'm, do I'm, doing, I'm doing my ABCs in my head. And I, this lady came up back on the back crawl and ran her whole, I mean like the extension of the length of my hair and then said, that's yours? When did you do that? Now mind you, she had not washed her hands. She came out the stall. I'm just speaking truth here. Okay, so this is common. This is not as uncommon as you would think. It usually doesn't happen in the bathroom but it happens on trains, it happens in meetings, it's the casual comments about. So the way this norm looks is I turn to her and I already knew the perception of black women in general is that we are angry and that we are aggressive and that we are overly emotional. Okay, so I already, and if you didn't know that was a perception on black women, that's some information that is very alive and well. Um, I had to reframe how I was gonna do it. I said, do I snap and close the moment? For, Cause you know the snap was the first thought. And then I was like, wait, I got Harvard after my name. I can't be on social media. I'm gonna lose my job. Like, I can't. Right, and so I had to say, all right, this work is about love. She may not actually know it's a bad thing to touch someone's hair. And if I was gonna share some information, what would I do? So I turned to her and I said, I noticed that you touched my hair twice. <laughs> Do you know why? Because people who are uninformed actually need data. They don't know that they've done something. <laughs> they don't. Like, I'm not even trying to be funny. They don't, and you know what I'm talking about. When you're like, how could you just do that? Do what? <laughs> and you're like, run the footage back. So. <laughs> I notice that you have touched my hair multiple times. I'm wondering, here's the love moment. Here's the grace moment. Here's where this woman can take responsibility. I'm wondering if you know that when you touch my hair, you make me feel like an object. I'm wondering if you know that I feel like I am in a zoo and that you have just paid to pet me. I'm wondering if you know how long it is going to take for me to feel clean again, right? Now, here's the thing about this norm. Once I tell her and she receives that, she is not my work anymore. Because people of color are often overly exhausted having to always explain what is going on. So, this is a norm about partnership. If you tell me I receive that, I love you enough to believe you will be introspective and make those changes. Because now you have the data and some knowledge to know how that impacts people. I'm giving an example about hair because I don't want to um, alienate anyone in their experiences, but this is for race, gender, class, sexuality, ableism. And that's a hard ask. I know that's a hard ask of me. I'm asking you who have been hurt or who could be hurt to inform the person that hurt you, even while you are feeling hurt. And for those of you who are receiving it, I'm asking you to lower the defense and to not take it as an assumption that you are ignorant. There is a difference between being ignorant and uninformed. I want you to hold that. This is a norm and a practice of I notice, I wonder. We have done this with three-year-olds up. This does not have an age gap. You can do this with your students. You can do this with your parents. You can do this with strangers. And sometimes, you know, I do this in grocery stores. I am that person. I will full workshop all three. Because um, <laughs> for some reason, whenever I get dressed down, I'm a service worker. We're going to talk about that too. Um, so I walk in Whole Foods, everybody think I know where the avocados are. I don't know, I don't work here. I'm not wearing a green, I mean, what are those things called, aprons? I'm like, I'm not wearing a green apron. Going to airports, everybody wanna know where their gate is at. I don't know, I got a suitcase. 
Um, I don't work here. But the fact that you think I work here, I've noticed that you've asked me a couple times, right? So that's that norm. The next one is be able to express as much vulnerability as you are willing to offer. That norm, as you notice, does not say be vulnerable. Being vulnerable is a dangerous ask. People need to have conditions. So think about it like a spectrum. Some of you go to the beach and you don't even know how to swim. You go for the sand, you go for the drinks on the beach. I'm not implicating anybody in drinking. I'm also acknowledging it's summer. So whatever you do on the beach, some people don't come for the deep work. They come for the beach. Other people go to the beach and they say, I can't even understand how you would just sit on the sand. I'm going all the way out into the riptide, right? Give me a bucket of chum in shark season, a no flashlight, throw me off the boat. Don't tell me the Coast Guard is here, you know? So, and what I mean by that is there are people who come and wake up in the morning super teen vulnerable. Oh, yep, I'm gonna tell you all, ever tell you about the moment I was born. I'm gonna go all the way back. And then there are other people who are like, I'm not actually quite sure if I wanna divulge any personal anything to you right now. You can be on either sides of that. All I'm asking is wherever you normally are, just lean a little bit more in. And if you're out with the sharks and you need to come back to the beach, come back. And if you're on the beach and you wanna go see what's up with the sharks, go on. <laughs> like, there's a spectrum. Our next one is be open to a different perspective. Goes back to the window in the mirror. Don't spend so much time externalizing what other people can do. Think about what you must have to shift within yourself to be a part of the change. You got tambourines in the back? Okay, Sarah. Okay, Tulsa. No, excuse me, Little Rock, Little Rock, Tulsa's over here. Okay, I, they got tambourines, y'all, I'm sorry, I was excited. Um, our next one is be ready to actively listen, and we've already heard that today. Let me do some call and response. No one who has seen me do this before, okay? So no inserting. How long do you think adults can pay attention? Let's call it out. 20 minutes? Five minutes, three minutes? I'm gonna start calling random numbers because you know when everybody starts shouting, 15 seconds, okay. 12? Two hours? That is supreme optimism, I love it. So here's the thing, adults can only pay attention when they don't see commonalities between you and themselves for 20 seconds. The average adult attention span is five to seven words. So I'm telling you, to be equitable, we have to be empathetic. And to be empathetic, we have to listen. But most of us have stopped listening after seven words. You see, our brains neurologically are programmed to look for ourselves in other people. We are more likely to pay attention when we think we have something in common with people than when we don't. And you know what it looks like. It's the moment when someone goes, me too! You know they're gonna be listening. But then if I show up to a room and someone's like, I'm from Idaho. <laughs> and then of course, you know, isn't there a Brooklyn, Idaho? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, are you from there? They're like, no, I'm from the southwest part of the state. What state are you next to? You gotta be fully transparent. You know you from, when you're from New York, you don't know where anything else is in the middle, okay? I'm a byproduct of the New York City Department of Ed. I didn't know where all the states were until I was like 17 when I had to take AP US history and I discovered Idaho was like next to Washington State. I thought it was near Iowa. I didn't know, right? So this norm is about I am willing to sit with you and listen even if I don't see myself in what you're saying. Our next one is accept and expect non-closure. That's gonna be our biggest one today because I'm not gonna put this in a bow for you. I can't close it neatly because inequity is a multi-lifetime challenge. The work that you are doing right now, your children's children's children will stand on your shoulders to continue. The hardest part about this work is mortality. You see, everybody wants to have the legacy. Everyone wants to say that we've been the ones to end it in our lifetime. 
inequity was not created in one lifetime. It cannot be dismantled in one lifetime. So it doesn't mean that your work isn't powerful. I need you to begin thinking about your work as the contribution to a larger war to dismantle inequity. You are a part of an army. You are not the lone general who will change it all. Our next one's confidentiality. I think this fits more for your sessions after this keynote, where you're going to be telling your stories of self. This is a norm around we will not appropriate. Okay? So Vegas rules don't exist in equity work because of social media. So it's not a what happens at academy stays at academy. If someone says something that was powerful to you, you have to ask them permission to share it. And if they say no, no is a complete answer. That's it. This norm, because I always want to tell you why, this norm comes from a history of people of color being appropriated for our trauma and experiences to be the catalyst for social justice work. So what we're not going to do is overly traumatize particular people in this room to be the catalyst for other people feeling inspired to do the work. We're just going to be inspired to do the work and ask permission to share what we've heard. And if you have never heard anyone say these things before, own it. I'm not angry that you don't know. The reason you don't know is because structural racism made it so. I'm not angry if you don't fully know yet what I'm talking about. I'm just telling you there's a full structure in this world that makes it impossible for us to know how to do everything. We're going to check our guilt today because guilt doesn't change worlds, guilt stagnates. Our next one is step up, step back, and that's just, we want to be able to hear all voices and keep that in mind for your group. You're like, yo, this chick came up here and did norms for like 15 minutes. Yup, <laughs> I did. Because without norms, we will get hurt. Without boundaries to be in integrity with our work, we will hurt. And if you didn't think conversation was work, I'm here to tell you in social justice and equity, conversation is the action. Communication is the action. And having clear steps on how to communicate with people, check in with them with love, be able to lean into difference, know that it's going to be uncomfortable, know that sometimes you're going to have to go out into the deep end with the sharks when you don't know how to swim. But if that's the work, that that's where we need to go. So that's why I spend so much time there, because without these, we're going to learn a whole bunch of information with no boundaries of how to do it well. Okay. So we've heard a couple of folks talk up here today about social justice, about changing the world, about coding. We've heard Mithra talk about adaptive and technical challenges. And I think what's most important for you to know um, is that there is a difference between diversity, between equity, and between inclusion. That your work is the amalgamation of all of those things. You see, if your mission is to increase graduation rates, I need you to understand, first and foremost, education was never created to be equitable. It wasn't. We talk about the future purposes of education, but education was created in this country to sort children. Public schools, if you ever wondered why public schools have bells, public schools have bells because the bells were to acclimate students to working in factories. It was about keeping people on time, keeping people on a schedule. Independent schools were created for creativity. Independent schools were created for the entrepreneurs who would own the factories. Public schools were created for the factory workers. Okay, I'm just giving you some basics about the foundation of education. That doesn't make me pessimistic, though. It gives me some context to know that your work is a part of the structural change. Your work is about inserting hope, inserting innovation, supporting students, and overcoming some of the inherent boundaries that education automatically creates. To increase graduation rates, we have to be able to build empathy for students to understand, like, sometimes why education works and why it doesn't. It allows us to examine curriculum because we know 
I'm not sure if you know all of you, but educational curriculum is created to foster and lift up one culture, which is white culture. We're gonna talk about that, okay? So don't get nervous. I ain't gonna be up here talking about white privilege without defining it, but I am gonna talk about it. I'm gonna talk about it, right? And so those are things that are really important for you to know. Adaptive challenges are also important for your work. As you heard Mithra say, adaptive challenges are challenges that involve people changing their minds over time. The only way that people change their mindset is when you provide them with a story or a purpose or a reason for them to change. No one will change if they don't know why. The more assured you are in your personal why, and why are you advocating for your students? Why are you working with them? The better you are at communicating that work holistically, the more impactful you will be in your service year, the more impactful you will be as a person. This isn't just a job. This is life. And the implication of you knowing these things changes multiple worlds. I think it's also important to know, as we said, equity involves deconstructing systems of power. But it's important to know that just because you may be a part of the beginning of something doesn't mean that you're not successful if you don't see it through to fruition. In terms of, I didn't see all, I didn't dismantle every inequitable structure in this experience. That's okay. Did you make one to two significant changes? That's enough. Let me manage your expectations right now. As humans, we can only do one to two things well our entire life. Your legacy can be one consistent thing that you do well. But if you only did one thing, and that one thing was, I'm gonna make a commitment to deconstruct myself, to deconstruct my own privilege, to understand what my privileges are, to be more empathetic, to actively listen. I will tell you right now, that is not selfish work. That is not selfish work. We live in a society that has undermined people doing work on themselves. Because if you unpack yourself, if you deconstruct yourself, if you learn about what microaggressions you commit, if you learn about the things that you've said while being uninformed, you change millions of people. Because when you show up differently, they show up differently. Don't ever forget, everything about your service comes from everything about who you are and who you aren't. There is nothing wrong with doing due diligence to understanding yourself because your students will see it. When people come to do equity work, the first thing they say to you is not, what books have you read? The first thing they said is, what did you do? <laughs> and if you don't have an answer for them, it becomes hard to spread the work. And our Baldwin quote here, right? Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. You unpacking yourself is lifetime work. But you will never be bettered if you don't call that ugly out, okay? Because nobody can show you you're ugly but you. No one can make you change but you. But you. You have powerful ownership. You know what the beauty of focusing on yourself first is? You have ownership over yourself. You don't have to wait. You don't need a budget. You don't need money. You just need a commitment to be different. Because here's the beauty. I don't know if you know, everybody's biased. Everybody's biased. This isn't a black, white thing. This is a we all have biases, and I want to spend some time figuring out what they are. For some of you, it may not be race, but others of you, it could be gender. You may believe that gender is a spectrum, excuse me, a binary. For some of you, it may be things about ableism. It may be perceptions about who's successful and who's not, who can be where and who can't. Which students are going to be successful? What neighborhoods do they have to come from? Those are all things that are encompassed in that. 
I'm not going to show the video because I want to save time, but I'll talk us through it. I think one of the most important things for us to know is that there are four forms of racism. Some of you may have seen these before. Now, I'm not going to have a chance to do all the deep diving, but I will give us as much specificity as we can because I want to be respectful of our time. So I want to tell you a story because I think stories are important. I want to tell you a story about a fish and a fox, okay? So there's this fox who wants to be friends with some fish, okay? In this story, foxes and fishes don't eat each other, right? This is like a happier place. And so this fox decides to go down to a pond every single day. And he wants to ask these fish some foundational questions. So he goes down and goes, hey fish, how are the rocks? The fish are like, the rocks are great. You know, we get to rub our bodies on them, all our scales come off, we're perfect. Next day the fox comes down and says, hey fish, how's the sunlight? Um, the fish go, the sun is great, you know, it gives us algae, we get to eat more. And then one day the fox feels like he's run out of some questions. So he's pacing, 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 and then he decides, I got it. In this story, the fox also has an opposable thumb, which is why he can snap. Okay, because I don't know if you know, like we can only snap because we have thumbs. Um, all your science knowledge there. Um, and so the fox says, I'm going to ask the fish the question that I don't think I've ever asked them before. So he runs down to the pond and he shouts out, hey fish, how's the water? And the fish say, what's water? That's what ideological racism is. It's the thing that we swim in, the thing that sustains us the things that informs all of our bias, and we don't even know it's there. Ideological racism is the thing that tells us who's thin, who's not, who's beautiful, who's not, who's successful, who's not. How should I feel about brown people? How shouldn't I feel? How should I feel about white people? Who's ignorant? Who's got money? Who doesn't? And you know why it exists still? Because we don't know it's there. You cannot dismantle something that you cannot call by its name. Internalized racism is how much of this water have I swallowed. It's what you've actually embodied from this dominant ideology. Interpersonal racism is where we usually talk about macroaggressions and microaggressions. Interpersonal racism is where you spit that water out on somebody else. You know when little kids fill up their cheeks, they go that. It goes long and far. And then institutional racism is what happens when your water becomes a policy or a practice or a structure. I don't want to leave us there. I want to, I want to pull out the buzzwords, though. These are the terms that live in there. And I know I want to spend some time talking about the ideology, and I want to lightly talk about implicit and unconscious bias. And you'll take that into our afternoon time. I know some of you in the audience are going, that's a lot of white on the screen. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, and we're going to talk about it. This dominant ideology centers white culture as normative. Now, I'm not blaming white communities. I'm not saying that the white people in this room created it. I'm just telling you who this ideology says is normal. And then it otherizes everybody else. White privilege has nothing to do with money. White privilege is the ability to opt out to opt out of a conversation about race or difference. And I'm not saying you're doing it consciously. Because white culture and white communities are centered as normal, white people are never asked to think about themselves. We heard Mary Jane share something very powerful, right? Kind of the exploration into that. So white privilege is the ability to say, not now, this is not my conversation. People of color do not have this privilege, okay? Also, you can be a poor white person 
first generation college, everything, and still have white privilege. Okay, it's not about money, you know, and it's a term that people say and it makes people angry, they shut down. I'm just letting you know you have the distinct privilege to not have to unpack and deconstruct yourselves because I'll tell you one thing about this country, when you turn on the television, white people can see themselves in TV. White people can see themselves represented in leadership. When you go into a classroom, most of those teachers look like you. When you turn on the television, people look like you. You can live, eat, breathe, sleep, and die in an all-white community your entire lives. That's what the privilege is. White supremacy has nothing to do with the Klan, okay? That's not what this is. It is the myth that white culture or white people are globally dominant. Did you know that 88% of the entire world is black and brown? 88%, only 12% of the entire world identifies as white. So why is it that 12% has been able to center 100% of education for the most part. The supremacy is not about white people trying to take over the earth, right? Like I'm just dispelling all the things that come out. It's understanding that we actually believe that white culture and white things and anything we represent as white is the ideal. And so we honor it and lift it up as the golden ticket. So here's an example of white supremacy for some of you who may not be sure. Like you're like, I don't know, I hear, but like, I don't know. So 88% of the world is black and brown. The number one beauty product in the entire world used by 70% of this 88% is bleach. I'll wait. It's bleach. It's skin lightening cream. Why would 70% of 88% of the world want to bleach themselves? Because in this world, you get more privilege the lighter you are. I'm just a chocolatey black girl from Brooklyn. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do be in this level of chocolate from Brooklyn. If I was lighter, I don't know where I would be. I'm just telling you, like, the lighter you go, things happen differently for you. Also, an example of white supremacy, the BMI, the body mass index, the thing that we use to measure perfect bodies. Did you know the BMI was done with um, 8,000 white men and 12,000 white women, I'll wait. The very indicator of how we measure beauty and health and optimum bodies was done with 21,000 white people. But it is the standard set for all people. Just given some facts. Systemic oppression is the way in which systems overlap each other. Right? So it's the intersection of law enforcement meets education, meets housing, meets poverty, meets food. It's just overlapping and understanding that every sector or every industry you work in is its own system. And they compound on each other to create structures that marginalize certain communities. Implicit bias is the uninformed. It's the, I am saying something that is actually having a different impact on people, and I didn't realize that's what was happening. Implicit bias is not conscious. That's the, you saying something from a place of being uninformed and not realizing it's hurtful to someone else because you've never been in a space of difference. That's the microaggressions and macroaggressions. And knowing that you're gonna be doing work with students and work with each other, I wanted to give some examples. I just wanna put the definition up. I already said it, but I don't like to read my slides, okay? So the microaggression sounds small, but it's a continuous jab. It's oppressive, it's hurtful. For those of you who speak other languages or speak French, the word for microaggression in French is le petit mot the little death. I think it's quite fitting because these are statements that we make that kill people over and over and over and over and over and over again. A macroaggression is, is overt. You can't hide what it is. It's a straight up statement of bias. 
So a common example, I walk into a room, and they're like, Dr. Darnisa Monte. <sighs> you know, that's my crowd sound. And um, I come on the stage and I had a gentleman from the front row shout, where's Dr. Amante? And I said, I'm right here. And he said, we all know that those people don't get doctorates. This was like um, six months ago. That's a macroaggression. A microaggression is, Darnisa, you're the smartest black person I ever met. Am I? That's a microaggression. That's not a compliment. Darnisa, you're so articulate. That's not a compliment. That's a microaggression. So there are some of you in the room right now going, I just said that to somebody this morning. <laughs> Let me tell you why. All right, I'm not trying to guilt you, I'm just trying to inform us. The reason why telling a person of color, particularly that they are so articulate, the reason it's a microaggression is because you're suggesting that you didn't expect me to be that way. Didn't you just hear that educational pedigree? Okay, I was out here fighting for the dream. Brandeis and Harvard, I would hope I'm using some good adjectives at this point in my life. Um, there are some other ones, but I did have someone call me out with love just yesterday, so I want to own it in this slide. You see in this first slide where it says when you ask someone where are you from, no, where are you really from? The impact of that is suggesting that we don't think that you're American. But then someone said to me, I'm tired of the U.S. dominant narrative that the United States is all of America. So. This is the moment where I'm telling you, as your expert, that I still commit microaggressions. It's all about being graceful with yourself. I don't know everything. I didn't even realize that on this slide I wrote, you are not American, but I assumed that was the United States. There's Canada, Mexico, and South America, and Central America, but that slide does not represent that that I committed a microaggression in the slide describing microaggressions. I apologize in advance, but I can own it. I'm taking responsibility for it. It isn't right. I'm changing the slide, but I just want to convey, I've been doing this work for 15 years and I still discover new things. That's a beautiful thing to be able to say, I didn't know yesterday, but I know today, and now I'm sharing the learning with you so you know. Some other ones, the ascription of intelligence, um, color blindness. So here's why saying I'm colorblind is a microaggression. Because when you say you are colorblind, that means that you cannot see me. You cannot see the way that the skin that I am in has changed my experience in the world. If I walk into a room with a white woman next to me and they say introducing Dr. Amante, the room will turn to her and not me. Because I don't have a black last name, whatever that means. I'm just telling you that that's what happens. And so I need you to know there is a system that makes this world difficult for black and brown people, that I understand the hope behind colorblindness. That's where we're headed, that's our goal, but we are not post-racial yet, okay? Some other ones, I'm just putting up the most common ones here. I'm not racist, I have several black friends. As a woman, I know what you go through as a, racist, as a racial minority group. These are statements that sound like solidarity. The impact, though, is the fact that you can count how many black friends you have, right? Like, I'm already asking questions. I'm wondering. I've noticed you have several. <laughs> but I also noticed that several means more than two and less than seven. That's what several actually mean. So how many you got? <laughs> and why are you telling me the number? Look, I got all the questions. And then the next one is, we don't want to compound and compare minority groups. This is not the Oppression Olympics. It's not the Oppression Olympics, but we do that. You know, it's like, I need you to understand that every group has experienced discrimination. And what I will say as I close, for my white folks in the room, I love you enough to tell you that there is no such thing as reverse racism. Now, the reason, the reason I'm saying that is white people have in fact experienced discrimination. 
you've experienced prejudice. Racism is about power. It's about the ability to disempower through statements. People of color have no systemic power. So we cannot be racist because we do not have the power to disenfranchise or marginalize entire groups. But we can, in fact, be prejudiced. I just needed you to know the difference. Because it's important, when, when a person of color hears reverse racism, the first thing I'm saying is, did I create the policy or structure that actually disempowered you? I can't do that. I don't have systemic power. I am a part of the marginalized. <laughs> um, so I just want to state that. Some other ones here. Let's not forget about environmental microaggressions. A college or university with buildings that are all named after white, heterosexual, upper-class males, okay? We often think about microaggressions as statements. Environments can be microaggressions as well. So think about this. If you have students of color sitting in a building called the Robert E. Lee School, and they have to walk past slave owners as a black or brown child whose ancestors were enslaved, that creates trauma, right? Like there is trauma that comes from environments, overabundance of liquor stores and communities of color. Some of y'all know it, right? You drive through the, whatever you define your hood is, and then it's like the pawn shop, the liquor shop, the bond shop, the like corner store that got all the fried chicken and stuff. If you in the South, where are my folks in the South? Little Rock? My other folks, Arkansas, like the best fried chicken I ever had is at a gas station in like backwater Mississippi, right? <laughs> like, that's where you get the good stuff. So like thinking about things like that, and I will give another microaggression that's not up here, but it's around gender, and it's men. When you tell women to calm down, when you tell women, I need you to be a little bit more rational, oh, you know what it sounds like, right? It's the, I love everything about what you're saying, but I don't need you to bring all your emotions to work today. Or, I just need you to, you know, this, this is not personal. This is business. And I need you to remove your emotions from this so we can have a rational, logical conversation. That's a microaggression too. Because it's suggesting that women cannot do logical, rational, or coherent things because our emotions are in the way. Gentlemen in the room, you too are emotional beings. But systemic oppression has convinced you that you shouldn't be. And so, I know that you're headed off to lunch. You will have access to all of my slides. This is, so, and just to give you some context, these are the conversations that we're having with all the leaders. These are the conversations we're hoping to have with you. This day, this experience is normally eight hours. So you've received a very modified version but I'm, you know, I and my team are very happy to follow up with more. The question I want you to go into lunch thinking about, the question I want you to sit with is what water have you swallowed and how may you be spitting that up on other people? Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>